What are the hubbub? Bub. The hubbub is from Bits und Bolts. A year ago, he made a video about making his own 4 meg 30 pin modules using the chips from 72 pin EDO RAM. And I've got some of those. He then redesigned the PCB to accommodate either EDO or the FPM chips. Let me take a whack at it. I ordered some PCBs. And what really appealed to me about this was being able to repurpose these EDO RAM modules that I have. This modified circuit board came about due to a commenter that revealed the secret to rewiring the EDO chips to work like FPM chips. With this new information, Bits und Bolts reworked the traces of a previously made circuit board and created this EDO slash FPM board. So after the board, the next thing that's required are the 1206 100 nanofarad capacitors. I got a package of 100, so I'm good for a while. So most importantly, I need some EDO RAM. Ram -lam 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 -ding -dong. So I dug through my 72 pin collection, and much to my surprise, I found more than I thought I had. The ones on the top are 32 megabyte. And those I had borrowed from the dual Pentium Pro board back in the Lightning and Mobos video. The Tyen S1662 Pentium Pro. But to my surprise, the ones right underneath, well, those are 16 megabyte modules. And all it took was a little searching on Google. I found the data sheet. It tells me that it's an EDO chip and that it's a 4 million by 4 bit. This one, I had incorrectly written 8 megabytes on the back of it, and it turns out that it's a 4M by 4 as well. And lastly, the Toshiba chips are actually FPM, and they're 4M by 4s. I can use those with the default setting on the bits und bolts board. I decided to save the 32 megabyte modules because I want to fix that dual Pentium Pro. Have you seen the Mr. Solderfix video? He has this technique that he demonstrates where he takes copper wire, wraps it around multiple legs of an IC or whatever, uses solder and two soldering irons, and the part falls down. If you don't have a hot air rework station, then all you need is some copper wire and, as I found out, one soldering iron. I wrap the copper wire around the legs, I'm giving an overview shot of this as well. It's only so helpful. <laughs> it's a little bit out of sync. At this point, I have decided to commit to doing this, and there's no turning back. I am now going to solder these legs on to the copper wire, and hopefully it will start to release. I am not sure at this point whether I'm going to require two soldering irons to do this. I've got a soldering gun that I'm prepared to use if need be. I give the first side a generous amount of solder, uh, way too much as it turns out. This just turns into solder that you have to remove in the end and waste more solder braid in the process. There's a big messy slop of solder and it's just falling down. I don't think I have it completely level. That would be a better choice. And more heat. And this is giving me no indication that it's going to release. I have never tried this before, so this is how you figure things out. Uh, you start sloppy and then you refine it but I'm still applying quite a bit of heat. The other side has already solidified. I gotta go back and forth. Now everyone has tried this at some point to remove an eight pin IC by running the soldering iron back and forth. At least I've tried that a million times and it's usually awful. Usually end up burning up the traces in the process. I've got my soldering iron set to 350 and I'm giving it all I've got and it just doesn't want to budge. I've made a mess of this board at this point. What am I doing?
definitely wouldn't recommend this technique. It worked, and I got better at it the more I did, but as I'll demonstrate later, it's a hell of a lot easier using a hot air station. Soldering these 1206 capacitors, it takes a bit of patience. But there's only two per board, so it goes pretty quick. I'm using the smallest tip that I have, but I'm doing it on an angle, and that really makes it easy to bridge between the two legs. This isn't the same as soldering through hole components. The, the way the solder wicks underneath to catch those pads, uh, it gives kind of odd results, so you really have to get into a, a rhythm. <laughs> Here it is complete, time to put it in the machine. I have made just one of these to begin with because I want to make sure that the chips have survived the transplant. And I'm testing this with three known good four megabyte modules. Oh, works. Test mount. Okay. We'll come back in a few minutes and see if that comes up with any errors. Well, we're up to pass number 20. Total failures, zero. Back to soldering on the capacitors. I made this modified closed pin to clamp down the chip while I was soldering in the bottom half. I was taking it slow, but I was beginning to feel a little more confident soldering these tiny legs on. Okay, all four brand new RAM modules are in the slots. Let's see if it boots. Don't you love that sound? Okay, test mem. Then we'll come back in a while. 55 passes, total failures, zero.
couldn't have done this back in 1993. Four megabytes. Eight megabytes. Twelve megabytes. Sixteen megabytes. Twenty megabytes. Twenty four megabytes. Twenty eight megabytes. And all the way to the max thirty two. Just kidding. It's fine. Let's see it work. Beautiful. At roughly $200 per 4 meg module back in 1993, would have run you about $1,600. And with inflation, that's over 3000 today. So what could you do with 32 megabytes of RAM? Bits und Bolts had a follow-up video where he demonstrated RAM drive running on the 386. And this is what I had to try. By loading all of the Windows files into RAM Drive, I'm now running Windows 3.1 strictly from RAM. And there is the icon that you only get when you run RAM Drive. I look forward to experimenting with RAM Drive and trying it with some music software. See what happens. RAM Drive. Very special thanks to Bits und Bolts for providing all the information on his incredibly awesome channel. Next time on Escape to DOS, we've got to fix my Sound Blaster Pro 2.0.